By the way, I'd be remiss, I guess, if I didn't say this to the church family, happy Valentine Day on today. And uh, we're going to have a Valentine's meal together. That wasn't the plan, but we'll make it that work. It looks very Valentine-y down there. Well, we continue in this series that kind of introduces the year. Uh, this year, of course, we've claimed as the year of excellence. Last year was the year of blessing. Second Peter 1.5 says, In your faith supply moral excellence. And the word excellence, as we're looking at it being defined, is extremely high quality or high virtue. And that's how we're looking at this. So, so far, how, what have we seen in the, this series? We have examined the importance of, for all people to first confess, repent, and die to sin while suffering to Jesus as Savior and Lord. This begins the sanctified life and is maintained as we live holy lives through daily surrender of the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we do this, it helps us move toward a work of perfection as we allow Christ to rule in us. This is demonstrated by followers of Jesus, in part by discovering our spiritual gifts and using them for the glory of God to build up His church. We are to operate in life as people who are set apart for God thereby different in character than those who are not Christians or followers of Christ. This kind of excellence requires what we're going to look at today, and that is commitment. In June, starting June 30th, 1859, and going on till 1896, a man named Charles Blondin, that was actually his stage name, but he was considered the daredevil of Niagara Falls. He had tight-roped walked across Niagara Falls 300 times during that time period. The first time he was going to do it, he was trying to figure out how to put up a cable that could stretch across the leg of like 1,600 or, yeah, feet uh, across the length of that where he was going to cross and he figured the only way he could do it that was safe enough that the cable wouldn't break, whatever, was if he actually climbed up one side of the surface while the other one's attached over there. And that's how he hooked it up for the very first time. The very first time he went to walk across Niagara Falls, in 1859, 25,000 people came to watch him on both sides of the border. He made it, by the way. That's how come he could go 300 times. He crossed. This is just some of the ways he did it. Every time he did it, he wanted to did it. He wanted to do it again with more panache. He wanted to do it with more excitement. He crossed during the daytime. He had a very long pole for balance, and he'd walk across. And the falls, as you can imagine, are tumbling down there. The boats, the tourist boats, are down there looking up. The people are looking off to the side. And he crossed, and then he crossed back again. He wanted to look a little different, so one time he carried a table and a chair across, and then he put the chair down and was going to sit at the table, and the chair fell, and he lost his balance, but then caught himself, and of course the crowd went, woo! They're there to watch him fall, perhaps, or not fall, but the excitement was there. One time he carried a backpack, and in the backpack he had a stove, and he also brought along some eggs, and he got to the center of, on a tightrope, which is no thicker than an inch thick, according to what I read. And he, and he did all this balancing in the middle of Niagara Falls, and he cooked an omelet <laughs> to make it exciting for the people. And then he lowered the omelet to the tourist boat. He lowered it down there for one of those folks to get. He had presidents that would come and watch him do this. And... Um, he even, at one point, carried his manager on his back. You talk about a manager trusting his act. And his manager went on back. One, at one point, it said he even carried his own son across on this. And Blondin had this theory. He said, if you put a net underneath you, you're really not fully convinced you're going to make it. So he had never used a net. One time, he walked across backwards. It was the first recorded moonwalk. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. He walked across, and when he got to the Canadian side, 
The crowd, of course, was cheering. He did it, and he grabbed a wheelbarrow, and he said, how many think I can take this wheelbarrow across? And all the people are going, yeah, you can do it, blah, then great. He goes, someone get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> and he went across with an empty wheelbarrow. <laughs> what separated the thousands of spectators from crossing with Charles Blondet? Commitment. They would not commit to the fact that I can trust this guy enough to get me on the other side. Charles Blondin, by the way, died at age 73 of diabetes complications. Luke 9, 57 through 62 says, As they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the nest have of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, follow me. But the man said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the, bed, the dead to bury the dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I'll follow you, Lord. But first permit me to go say goodbye to those back home. And Jesus said, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Just a little over a week earlier, Jesus had told the crowd after he had fed the 5,000 in Luke chapter 9. And he was saying to all of them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. What does it take to be a follower of Jesus? Commitment. Last Sunday, if you watched the Super Bowl, I'm not saying this is, how, this is why the outcome came it did, but it was interesting that it came out the way it did. During the Super Bowl last week, the Carolina Panthers were down by one score late in the game. The Broncos' defense had shut down the Panthers throughout the entire game and had sacked its quarterback numerous times. The Panthers were on offense deep in their own end of the field, when a Denver player hit the Panthers quarterback and he fumbled the ball. There was a scramble by both teams to recover that ball because it really meant the difference in the game at that point. At one point, there was a Panther and there was a Bronco going after the ball and the quarterback was standing looking down at this fumble and he took a step forward as though he was going to lunge into the pile and try to wrestle that ball and keep possession of it. And then he stopped and he backed out. What happened then was Denver recovered the ball, scored another game, put it out of reach, and sealed the Super Bowl victory for the Denver Broncos. For whatever reason, the Carolina Panther quarterback was unwilling to make a commitment to fight for the possession of that ball at that crucial moment in the game. Excellence of faith is defined by commitment. Are you willing to dive into the pile for Jesus? Are you willing to jump into the wheelbarrow for Jesus? Are you willing to take up the cross daily for Jesus? Because if we say yes, that means we must be fully committed to what that means. Every year, we, or almost every year, we offer a class on church membership. We start the class with the question, what's the difference between people who come regularly to church and people who are committed to be a part of church in every way possible? It's commitment. 
My son, who's a pastor, was telling me that the church where he was pastoring, he has a person in his church that actually told him, I intentionally do not become a member because I know then I cannot get elected to certain offices in the church. In other words, I'm not committed to everything here. I'm committed to what I want to choose. Kind of like a buffet, I guess. I like that, but I don't like that, so I don't have to take that. And they can't make me because I'm not a member. The difference between attendee and members can be summed up in one word. It's commitment. Now, I don't want to get lost here. The message is on commitment to serving Jesus Christ. I'm going to use a portion of the membership material to emphasize that. I'm not trying to pound everybody here to become a member if you're not a member of the church. Certainly, I would embrace that you would be interested in that. But I want to use the material to emphasize the importance of being sold out, fully committed to Jesus Christ. Membership says, in our, in our presentation, it says, I belong here. And God says that believers belong together. Romans 12, 5 says, So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, individually members of one another. Hebrews 10, 23 through 5 said, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And God, of course, is the one who promised. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. When we say we're committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are saying, I belong here, and I need to be a part of the full body of believers in serving Jesus Christ. You sense that God wants you here with people of the Hibbing Alliance Church, this is the membership package part, at the time in your Christian life, and you want to make a public declaration that you're committed to God's work through the church. Well, even broader than that, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, then we want to be committed and make a declaration that we belong to Christ. I'm committed to Him. And therefore, I will serve Him with excellence. The second thing in this presentation says we share the same ministry goals. And God says that believers are to be committed to one another for the sake of spiritual impact. Ephesians 4.16 for whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. To be a member of the church, to be committed to Jesus Christ, you and I believe that Jesus has work to do in Hibbing, in St. Louis County, the state of Minnesota, across the world, and you're willing to join with others to see that this mission gets accomplished. That's the commitment part. Membership says, I accept responsibility for a group of fellow believers in the family of God. And that is God's plan as well. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, Brothers, even if anyone, if anyone is caught in any trespass, any sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, such that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are of the household of faith. We're to encourage one another. We're to help one another. We're to love each other with such commitment that when we see a brother or a sister that is walking away from God, we don't wag our tail, fingers at them or wag our head and go, that's a shame. We go after them and say, wait, I care too much for you to see you go down that road and disappoint God and offend Him. You want to be part of a caring network of people, sharing one another's joys and sorrows, helping one another grow through worship, Bible study, fellowship, that's what the body of Christ does together. Membership also says, I am accountable. 
to mature brothers and sisters in Christ for my walk with God. And God warns against spiritual autonomy. I'm accountable. So if I'm the person, let's say, that's walking in a way that I shouldn't walk, doing something I shouldn't be engaged in, and my brother or sister comes to me and says, I'm very concerned about you, someone who's committed to Christ will be grateful for that expression of love and say, I'm accountable to my brothers, mature brothers and sisters in Christ. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Matthew 18, 15, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private, and if he listens to you, you have won your brother. You and I don't want to do, go it alone when standing for Jesus Christ. We want to receive the guidance, equipping, and assistance necessary to remain on target, remain on task as a good follower of Jesus Christ. That comes through the church, and our situation comes through the local church. Membership also says, I accept responsibility for things, how things are done here. And God says that's how it should be. I accept responsibility for how things are done here. And that's how it should be. After church today, we have an um, annual meeting. Annual meetings are part of a part of the church and part of the government, because if you are if you are a, um, a recognized organization, the government says the only way you can be recognized is if you have an annual meeting and you have a list of members. Okay, that's the legal aspect of membership, which we'll look at in just a moment. Okay. Members elect church officers. That is not a um, biblical model per se but it's a model that we follow okay and uh, it's not an anti-biblical model either by the way so i was like well you're just sinning you're like, oh, there he is pastor wait wait don't do it that way <coughs> we approve an annual ministry budget as well as directing the major decisions of church ministry every member has a say or should feel they have a say in shaping our church's direction and ministry goals that's why you have an annual meeting you sit down you talk about what god's done in the last year talk about what the future is going to hold, ask if there's any questions. People have questions, they should feel the freedom, you should feel the freedom to ask any question. And say, well, here, i got a question, what about this, what about that? So there's clarity, so that we realize we're in this together. It's not a pocket of nine people making the decisions for 90 or 100, but rather it's nine people representing everyone during the course of month to month, and when we have special meetings, annual meetings, the congregation as a whole then sits down and says, okay, we need to get caught up. How are we doing? How, what's God been doing in our lives? And what are we looking forward to in the future? That's why we have an annual meeting. That's why we invite you to come. Now, if you're not an active member, in other words, you're not on the membership rolls, but you attend here faithfully, I mean, obviously you're welcome to come to the, the lunch. You're welcome to come. You're welcome to ask questions. Membership, one of those privileges is that when there's a vote on something, official only if people who are on the membership list can vote but you can ask any question you want and we'll be happy to answer that to the best of our ability let me look for just a moment and i'm doing this on the uh, on the fly here um so first corinthians chapter 20 i'm waiting for my my notes to come ba back to me and they're very slow <laughs> last time i had to go to pastor luke on this one in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, excuse me, verse 20. That's not taking. Hang on just a moment. I'll bring it up here. You'll just you'll be so impressed with my technological advances here. Beginning with verse 20. This is what the scripture reads in 1 Corinthians 12. I'll 
I'll start with verse 19 because it's in the chapter, beginning of the chapter. But I also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from being blown up into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. An enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a body, but a monster. What we have is one body with many parts, each its proper size and in its proper place. No part is important on its own. Can you imagine the eye telling hand, get lost, I don't need you, or head telling foot, you're fired, your job has been phased out. As a matter of fact, in practice, it works the other way. The lower the part, the more basic, therefore necessary. You can live without an eye, for instance, but not without a stomach. What's, when it's a part of your own body, you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed, higher or lower. You, ca- you give it dignity and honor just as it is without comparisons. And if anything you have more concern for than the lower parts and the higher, if you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion to a full-bodied hair? Obviously, this is, this is an English version here, a, a paraphrase here. The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention, the parts we don't. The parts we see, the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part hurts. And in the healing. If one part's in the healing, every part's in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into exuberance. You are Christ's body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of the body does your part mean anything. You're familiar with some of the parts that God has formed in the church, which is the body. and goes on and talks about some of the gifts that we talked about last week. The point is that we are willing to accept responsibility for that we are a body of believers, not just individuals with by ourselves and finally membership as i mentioned keeps us legal first peter 2 13 through 17 submit yourselves for the lord's sake to every human institution whether to a king as the one in authority to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right for such is the will of god that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men Act as free men. Do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. In our case, honor the president. The state of Minnesota recognizes churches if they have a credible membership and organization. Obedience to these laws affirms that we're good, responsible citizens with a desire to serve. Now again, The last part of the message was notes for our church membership class. But it certainly speaks more broadly to the followers of believers of Jesus Christ. The difference between an attendee and a member can be summed up in one word. It's commitment. The difference between a growing believer and a stagnant believer is commitment. The difference between a mature believer and an immature believer is commitment. I think even in in the context of the old King James Version where it talks about the the, uh, um, I lost it, forget it. It it was talking about Christianity and it talks about there's a carnal Christian and then there's the devoted Christian. They're both Christians but one's living and fighting the sinful thing and the other one's living in victory, the difference is commitment. If I'm committed to Jesus Christ, then I'm committed to acting the way He calls me to act, to, to, to be obedient in the way that He calls me to be obedient, to walk in holiness and, and, and strive after it in the way that He calls me to because I'm committed to Him. Knowledge about being holy, knowledge about walking in obedience, 
isn't commitment. Commitment is embracing it and seeking it and living in it. And yeah, there'll be times that we fail. But we will have more success when we're committed to Christ in these things than if we're just happy to be a believer and let somebody else be the mature one. The difference between growing believer and stagnant believer is commitment. So the question I want to leave with you is, which do you choose to be? Because it really is up to us how we're going to live our life with and for Christ. How do you want to live that life? Obviously, God has expectations that are that we will live with great growth and maturity and will be holy like He's holy. But it's up to us whether or not we are going to move in that direction. I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward as we pray. Heavenly Father, <laughs> Lord, oh, the word commitment carries so much responsibility and Lord, there's times that we just don't want that. It's, it, it's just astonished. We don't want the, what we feel is a burden. But Lord, you have designed the body of Christ to be strongest when we are committed to you together, serving you together, seeking you together, Yes, there is this intimate, personal relationship that I have an individual and others have as individuals with you. But the way that you've designed the church to reach people for Christ is to do it together. To grow is to do it together. So Lord, I pray that if any of us are here this morning and we hear that knocking on our heart's door by the Holy Spirit, Saying, this is where I want you. I want you committed to me. Not just acknowledging me. But today, Father, we will know that we can just say, Father, I surrender. And I am committing my life to you. Recommitting my life to you. That I will put aside my selfish things, desires and opinions and character conduct that I will put God you first above all else forgive me for not doing that God if that's a sincere prayer coming from the heart of your child you will honor that prayer and that Lord you will help each one of us to grow more and more and more every day in the image of Christ as we commit ourselves to you, taking up the cross daily. Receive us, Lord, as we provide ourselves as an offering to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.